Hello to those of you who joined us for the earlier sessions today and those that are joining the BU virtual conference for the first time now, a very big welcome. My name is Joanna Griggs, I'm a Beyond Blue board director, have been for seven years. I've had the honour of being involved with BU since its inception in 2017 and I have seen this initiative just go from strength to strength. I also chair the National Advisory Council where we bring together just the best minds in the country from implementation and framework and strategy, strategy and marketing and we have representatives from every state and territory and of course government level of world for education and health. It's just one of the great thrills in my life. As is today, I'm so delighted to host this conversation with you and I'm really looking forward to spending the next 50 minutes with you. First up though, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And as an initiative with national reach, we also extend our respect to the elders and of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people right across Australia. Now, if you would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land where you sit today, we really encourage you to do so through the chat feature. Let me tell you about BU. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it today if you've been on, but um, you can always learn more. BU is a national mental health initiative for educators and they are the organiser of this conference. It's led by Beyond Blue in partnership with Early Childhood Australia and Headspace. Best of all, it is completely free. It is available to every educator, every early learning service and school in Australia. The goals of BU, well, it's to empower educators to support children and young people's social and emotional wellbeing, as well, importantly, their own mental health. It offers educators online professional learning, fact sheets, interactive sessions and events and other resources. It offers learning communities tools and processes to implement a whole learning community approach to mental health and wellbeing, including support from a BU consultant, and they are just fabulous. Look, the discussions throughout this conference obviously highlight to you constantly the BU resources, the tools and the professional learning. And that is because it's to show you how BU can support a whole school approach um, and service to mental wellbeing. Um, today was a great day for uh, the theme obviously was educator wellbeing, which for us is a, a strategic priority of BU. Now, you also come into this conversation with just so much experience and knowledge, and we'd love to hear from you today. We'd love you to actually put some questions to us. I'm going to introduce our panellists shortly, and honestly, nothing is off limits, so please use the chat box during this session. Now, prior to that, we have also had some questions that you've submitted to uh, before today, and what we noticed was when they all came in that there were actually four quite similar themes, uh, and they're the ones that we will tackle in between hearing from you. Now the conference is also being recorded and this is really important. This might be something that you want to watch again or it actually might be something that you want to share with one of your colleagues or your peers. All recordings are going to be available on the BU website in four weeks time and that's for every session of both days. And just a little teaser here at the end, you're also going to receive a certificate of participation for joining us today which we will email to you. Now, I have the honour of introducing my fellow panellists here today. I would like to introduce, first of all, Debbie Yates. Now, Debbie is a State Manager for BU at Early Childhood Australia. Hello, Debbie. Hi, Joe. Nice to be with you today. Normally, at this part of the day, you give a bit of an intro about us, but you've encouraged us to share yeah. today about ourselves. So, I guess my previous experience, I'm an early childhood teacher, and I've taught across both early learning services and also in primary school settings. So I've got a bit of experience across both spaces. I've also worked as a manager at a range of community organisations that have a focus on supporting families and children. So, that's a bit about my background. And she should actually be wearing a cape because Deb actually had to, to get through the floodwaters to be with us today. We weren't even sure that you were going to make it at one yes, stage. Yes, we so did have a plan goodness. B in place in case I didn't get here. I am I live on the central coast just above Sydney, so has been impacted quite a lot by the floods, as, as a lot of areas have across New South Wales and Queensland. So we'd really like to, you know, send best wishes yeah. to everybody in those situations. But I'm very thankful I could make it down today. Yeah, and we also know that that's going to be affecting our educators currently and obviously into the future. So that's something else that BU will focus on not too far away. I'd also like to introduce Jeanette James. Now, she is a BU National Service. Service Development Advisor at Headspace. You do your spiel, Jeanette. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jo, and thanks for being with us here That's today. That's right. Love and it. Nice to join um, Deb as well. So my name is Jeanette James, and I'm the National Service Development Advisor. Um, like Deb, I've been involved with mental health and wellbeing in learning communities for quite um, some time, and have enjoyed particularly. Um, 
family engagement as well as partnership brokering. Um, I've worked in the space between the uh, world of school yep. and supporting students to that transition to the world of work and particularly interested in help seeking um, and promoting help seeking behaviours. And apart from that, Jeanette, I'm going to have to refer to you as what I know you as, which is JJ. Um, it, JJ is an unbelievable chef. So if you don't actually follow her on Instagram and actually live for her posts like I do, I recommend it because honestly, she will blow your mind. You and Luella, <laughs> something else to see. Anyhow, back to what we're talking about today. It has obviously been a really fabulous uh, day today. We had that keynote speak, speak this morning by Jerry Sumter and Patrice O'Brien. and. For me, that was actually a bit of a particular highlight because it actually offered really practical suggestions mm. around, you know, not only looking after our own mental health, but what we all know that our educators and early uh, service leaders have to do, which is supporting their colleagues as well as the whole communities. And I think the key takeaway for me was get support early. Mm. Don't wait till you're at crisis point. Um, you know, there's so many steps that you can take, even if you, you know, we talk about the the continuum and the green zone, the orange zone, the red zone. If you're in that green zone, there's things you can do to stay there. If you get to the orange zone, there's things that you can do to get back to that green zone. And I just thought that that's just, you can't reiterate that message enough. What, what about for you, Deb? What was your highlight? Yeah, I think for me, it was actually listening to one of the concurrent sessions. There was Trish and Dee who were sharing about transitions yeah. and how they impact on mental health and wellbeing. And Dee was really talking about herself and um, how she'd been managing transitions over this period of time. And also how um, Trish, as her consultant, mm -hmm. actually reached out to her one day and said, hey, are you OK, Dee? Such and she an said that was just thing. such an important thing for her to have someone do that check-in point with her and go, you know, are you okay? You're looking after everybody else, but what's happening for you? And just like you said, that's a really important starter question. Yeah. And next steps is, the, is um, the other conversation that you then have. Yeah. Well, that's brilliant. What about for you? Yeah, yeah agree, Deb. I mean, that the self-care of educators and looking after the carers yeah. is particularly um, important. Uh, yeah, I really like Jerry and Patrice's keynote at the beginning where they spoke, there was an image of, of yachts. And even though we're weathering the same storm, yeah. you could be a yacht, you could be a boat, you could be a cruiser. And even though it's a similar environment or situation or a learning community, um, everyone does experience things differently. And yeah. some people reacted to, say, let's talk about COVID this year or last year. Some people handled that really well and other people it was quite a big stressor for them. So I think it's important to recognise that everyone does handle things differently. And it's important to check in. Because yeah. even though you as a leader may be handling, your um, peers or your colleagues may not be. So that, that importance of checking in is mm. but also that big takeaway. Do you reckon that timeline's really important as well? Because they're also not going to react at the same mm. time. So you can't just give one answer that's no. going to make everyone feel better at mm. one point. It, it yeah. might be several months down the track, like we actually are seeing with the bushfire recovery at the moment. And mm. on what you said before, about it's not, not a luxury. You shouldn't wait till the end. Yep. You know, we need to build this into our schedule and our daily routine or our weekly routine because that's important to, 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 to have that time to ourselves in, in order to feel rejuvenated and to refuel. Mm. Yeah, I, I like those messages this yeah. morning and throughout and so the concurrent when sessions. you're in the green zone, you can help someone who might not yeah. be in the orange. I yeah. think that's mm. the other thing too, is that there's that recognising that I'm in a comfortable place at the moment means that I can maybe be that support for someone else and that might be reversed at another point mm. in time, yeah. Brilliant. Well, we do have a poll today. Uh, we love a bit of a poll on our <laughs> beautiful conferences. Um, reflecting on today's session, we're asking you, what do you see? And you can actually answer this if you haven't taken part in any of the earlier sessions as well. But what do you see as a key element to supporting a whole learning community approach to mental health and wellbeing? Is it A, understanding the mental health literacy, which, you know, can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming as well because there's a lot of it out there? Is it B, leadership support? C, embracing inclusivity and diversity. D, positive workplace culture. Or E, normalising help-seeking behaviours. Now, there might be something else that you see. I mean, to be honest, I'm looking at where is F, which is <laughs> yeah. all of the above. above. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think you can in the chat, there's options that, um, in the poll, there's options that you can choose multiple responses as well. But if you have another strategy in the sharing of, of ideas, please pop them in the chat because we do collate these um, into resources at the end of the uh, conference. Mm. Yeah, great. Well, while we actually allow everyone the time to fill out the poll, well, let's talk about some of the educator market research that mm. has just been done. Now, in December 2020, Beyond Blue commissioned Ipsos to conduct the third annual BU Educator Research Project. Now, they recruited a representative sample of 961 participants across the education sector of Australia, which was fantastic. Mm. We appreciate everyone's time who actually was involved with it. Um, some really 
fabulous things came out of it. And I think positive things floating forward. They did, they did. And I think part of it is that it actually reaffirmed the stories we were hearing from early learning services and schools. So it really told us that educators um, are noticing that depression, anxiety and other mental health issues continue to be the top issue facing learners in Australia. And that almost all educators now feel that supporting the mental health of learners is really an important part of their job, which tells us that BU is needed now more than ever. Yeah. I think it also showed us that awareness is the greatest agent of change mm. and that mental health literacy point is, is integral. Yep. So um, the research showed us that BU um, educators were more likely to recognise the signs and symptoms of different mental health concerns and issues. They were more likely to support children and young people that were experiencing poor mental health at any given time and to initiate that conversation, which yeah. is that often that first step, so the notice and the inquire and provide model that we'll speak about um, later on, but not only for the learning community, but to the families as well. Mm. Yeah, which quite often is that first hurdle that people mm. are, are almost afraid to take. They're, they're afraid, not necessarily that they'll you know, do the wrong thing, but they might say the wrong thing. Mm. And, and I think if they have that knowledge and they have that confidence of what to say and how to then be able to take the next steps forward, that's got to be a great thing. It does. And it opens up that conversation. Like I said, it's really about feeling confident to initiate that conversation. Yeah. Once you start, then it's, it's so much easier to flow on to the next parts. But just like you said, taking that first step and yeah. starting the conversation can often be the hardest. Yeah, and not, not only maybe the, the stigma around mental yeah. health and, and taking that first step, but sometimes people, you don't know what you don't know, right? Mm. Yeah. So they don't, maybe they don't know where to go or how to seek help. And there's so many resources out there they're like conversation starters from from um, uh, Are You OK Day, for instance, mm. that helped those prompting conversations yeah. if you aren't sure at any given given time. Mm. We actually have a question here. This mm. is from Adam Sermatch who says, can we unpack further the common language that we are to use within the service about wellbeing? Like, what are some suggestions to build a repertoire of words that could assist us all? Mm. I think probably, and it's actually interesting because this is one of the responses to one of the other questions, but for me it's actually about Adam. developing that language <laughs> and developing that language within your community. Yeah. So I think actually opening up that conversation and asking your community what are the words that we use that we feel familiar with, that feel comfortable for us to actually have these conversations. Because mm -hmm. depending on the makeup of your community, their current understanding around mental health and wellbeing, perhaps cultural differences yeah. that might be um, at play in your community. So it's really important to ask that conversation and not assume yeah. or not make a decision yourself, but to ask others and get a collective voice around that. Yeah. Yeah. You want to say anything? Yeah. Sorry, sure. I always want to say something. Yeah, mental health literacy is the is, you know the number yeah. one basic foundation of, of mental health within school communities and learning early learning communities. But starting off with like the BU resources, but the the different layers and the different approaches and mm -hmm. the different stakeholders, the students. So if the students are talking the same language, if the parents yeah. and the families are talking the same language, mm -hmm. if the, the sector supports are talking the same language, um, so you can't be what you can't see. So yeah. the more we model help-seeking behaviours and the more we're experiencing and chatting about the importance of mental health and wellbeing, that supports the shared language. Mm. So sometimes it's as easy as ensuring that all the different stakeholders are on the same page with the planning of mental health. Well, I think one of the other great things that came out of the educator market research was um, very clearly schools and early learning centres are prioritising mental yeah. health more than they've ever done before. Yeah. yeah. And it's obvious because there's a need. So, I mean, that's it's not putting the horse before the cart. They, they, they see the need. But the fact that they're embracing looking and learning as much as they can to find the best ways that they can help their, their whole school communities. And I say whole school communities because it's not just the students we're talking about or just the educator we're talking about. Mm. It's actually getting everyone at every level involved if we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think COVID's changed that at all, Joe? I think COVID changed things dramatically. Yeah. I mean, in a way, it sounds terrible, but it, 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 obviously everything went online. And that's one of the great things about mm. BU is this is all offered online. And so I think people access things probably with less hesitancy than they were doing previously. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's changed a lot of things that might actually hang on for a long time, but certainly for educators. I mean, that was that was the most challenging mm. year in the most challenging cir circumstances on a number of fronts. And mm. then particularly in those areas, I mean, COVID was traumatic enough, but in the areas that were affected by bushfires yeah. and, you know, and now we're seeing floods, floods. Yeah. like it's... She can be a drought prior to that. I mean, it can be a pretty cruel country when it wants to be. I think it really showed the importance of that family engagement yeah. and, and the importance that you really need to engage with our families in order to enhance learning and to mm -hmm. optimise learning. Yeah. Um, I think that, that was one of the key lessons from last year for me. 
Okay, so uh, what does Adam say now? He says, how do you remain professional with sharing? And I say that in the loveliest way, Adam. I want this just to keep coming and anyone else as well. How do you remain professional if sharing mental health struggles? He battles with this as he feels in danger of oversharing with work colleagues. And this would cross the line between being a professional and becoming personally involved. I think that's a great question. Mm. Yeah. I think this is where we really need to consider not just those individual connection points, but actually the systems and structures that sit within um, the early learning services and schools. So, you know, for some people talking about process or systems can be a bit like, eh, but that's not, you know, is that really relevant? It actually is really relevant. So making sure you've got really strong systems and structures can support you to consider your boundaries, what sits within your role and um, your professional responsibilities, and what that looks and feels like within your community. So I think having those sisters and structures in place is a really strong support for, for you as an individual, a professional within that workspace. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that planning time is really yeah. important to have. I mean, it, we always use that analogy of a garden, but it's so true, isn't yeah. it? You need to really cultivate the garden and the garden bed and have that planning in order for the trees and the gardens to flourish. And I think that's the same with learning communities. Um, and if, if someone was struggling and they felt um, either for them the, the mental health stigma is preventing them from discussing that with another. There are an example that came to mind was a school that we worked with in the Hunter Valley where um, a really passionate mental health coordinator, she mapped the strengths of the educators to the strengths of the students and like a buddy system approach. So not only were they connecting and feeling that sense of belonging just because of the relationship, but it was two way. So because they shared similar strengths, yep. Um, they were able to, to encourage each other, they were able to share with each other. So the student was encouraging the teacher yeah. around certain um, avenues and so the teacher was also sharing with the student. But then when there came that moment where they, one of them was struggling, then they could share that with each other as well. But if they noticed it, so for particularly, um, so a student was to notice that the teacher was struggling at any given time, they could say, hey, Miss, I noticed that, you know, Miss Griggs yeah. is, is struggling you know, maybe she needs some support or help. Mm. I think that was a be beautiful strategy that school put in place. What you're both talking about is actually coming through ironically on the poll. I mean, we're mm. talking about whole learning communities yeah. and what is actually leading in the polling at the moment is a positive workplace culture. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about BU, if, you, if you're if you actually accessing the resources and taking the steps to create an entire community that is understanding and knowledgeable and supportive of one another, well, you have a positive workplace culture. So, you know, what you're saying is absolutely bang on. Well, as we mentioned before, we have lots of questions that we also received before. And Adam, I want you to keep yours coming as well. <laughs> and anyone else would like to send us some. Um, but we also, as I mentioned, we had lots of questions that were submitted prior to today. Mm -hmm. um, so we're actually going to tackle those in between. Mm -hmm. And the first one, ladies, is how can we encourage all staff to contribute to a positive workplace culture? And I think particularly when you look at that, that polling was that at this planned? point. Was that planned? Was that planned? I just got a thing going, hey, Joanna, you know, go to check the poll results. I was like, wow, I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to go first? I'll, I'll step in first yeah. if that's okay. And I think it's, like we just were talking about before, it really does flow on around that element of starting with having open conversations about what a positive workplace culture looks like. But not just even what does it look like, what does it feel like, what does it sound like, what do you experience when you work, walk into that setting and how is it relevant to your specific community because it should hopefully look and feel and sound different in different spaces. I think building that understanding and that community ownership of what a positive workplace culture is, is such an important first step and it's often missed. There can be real assumptions that people make that when they use language such as workplace culture or wellbeing or mental health, that we're all talking about the same thing and we all have a common understanding, but that's often not the case. Mm -hmm. So really starting there by having those initial conversations, working out what that is, acknowledging different perspectives, like really acknowledging that different, you know, different people have different views on that yeah. and building a collective plan to work towards positive workplace culture is really important. That has to include, I guess, a variety of approaches and strategies to support the fact that there's different perspectives around that. Um, I guess one of the examples that came to mind for me was um, a family daycare service and they have some challenges when they're considering a positive workplace culture because they're not all in the one building. So you might mm. have a service coordinator who's supporting family daycare educators that are working in their own home 
often across a really, you know, large geographical area. And one service coordinator we were speaking to once, she actually talked about how when she was inducting new educators, one of the things she asked them was, what do you prefer, coffee or tea? How do you take your coffee and tea? Like, what, is that, what does that look and feel like for you? Like? So they kind of did that, she recorded that, because one of her jobs was to actually go visit them in their home and to have conversations with them. And she wanted that to not feel like she was, you know, coming in to, you know, assess them or check them. It's a, it's a it's supportive personal, conversation. It's... So she made sure she brought them their preference of the tea and coffee and how they like it. <laughs> Sweet. And I just thought that was such a small, simple thing. But gee, that builds a positive workplace culture. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's just a, a little example that I think it really highlights how even in diverse service um, structures where you're not all in the one building, yep. you can still take those little steps. Yep. Mm, really? mm, I love it. I love yeah. the, the small steps. So I think <laughs> now I feel like I want to copy. actually a really important thing to keep in the back of your mind at oh, all times. Absolutely. And it doesn't I, have to be daunting. No, you don't have to leap in completely. Yeah, that's right. It's just, just take that first step. Just take that first leap. And um, it does remind me of work, workplace climates maybe 10 years ago, 15 mm. years ago, and how much we have changed. I mean, we spoke about yeah. COVID last year and, and how people are understanding the importance now of mental health and, yeah. and, and learning and enhancing learning. But men, before mental health and mental illness, people thought that, that mental health was synonymous with mental illness, and we know now that yeah. that's not. So again, that's down to the mental health literacy yep. and the shared language. Um, well, and the awareness. The, mm. ex yeah. Exactly, the awareness. Oh, we were coming into the city today and my son dropped me off at the train station and there was a massive amount of traffic. Yes. Um, and he said, oh, the sun's brought people out. And it, how true is that? So true. When the, when the yeah. sun's out, we come out to play. When the environment's right, we play. And mm -hmm. I think in making sure that we have that conducive school climate, learning community climate, staffing climate, but if people are feeling stressed, they can't commit. They don't have the, you know, the executive brain functioning to, in order to think and to feel and to, to react. So I agree with you, Deb, about that, the, the assumptions, because sometimes people don't understand what it can look like or what it, what it can feel like. Um, so I think it's important to, to, to strip it back and ensure that we have, you know, the, the, the key to the universe, yeah. the triple R, the, yeah. the relationships, 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 yeah. like mm. the example with the tea mm. and the coffee. Once you develop those relationships, it's much easier to put those um, mental health um, procedures in place. Mm. So I'm going to throw a curly one at you, think, yeah. taking all that into consideration, yeah. because Belinda has asked us, all right, well, what about when your yeah, school situation isn't set up like that. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to change, like, how do you put school culture to put staff yes. well-being at the front of school and dedicating time to deal with work staff bullying and other factors yes. that come up like that? I'd, I'd, well, I think you need to look at, if, if, it's not help, if it's not within your school system, I'm particularly talking for the school systems here from my point of view, is is reach out to the sectors. The yeah. sectors have so much in place now. The, the planning and the resources and their, their commitment and priority to, to staff and educator wellbeing is massive in the last two or three years. So I'd, if, if you're not getting that support within your own environment, I would reach out to someone um, within the sector and get support that way. What about for an early learning service? Yeah, and I think that is one of the challenges often for early learning services because the sector is quite, um, it's really diverse yeah. Yeah. and it doesn't necessarily have the systems, mass numbers yeah, or... the systems that sit around it sometimes as they might have in the school sector. So I think in those circumstances, um, one of the things you might still do is reach out to colleagues in other settings to get advice and support. Yeah. And also consider, consider the other, uh, you know, if it's a really serious issue, there are things like, you know, fair work, there are, you know, other bodies that you can go to if you really have a serious issue within your workplace. Um, but yeah, start, it's just with everything, starting That's small cool. is yep. still, uh, I still think that first small step is the important one. And don't ignore it. I mean, you mentioned yeah. that yes. right at the very yeah, beginning. Yeah. Don't let it go on. Because that's when you do reach crisis point yeah, before absolutely. you know it. So you, yeah. you just got to take it, think about it, and that in the, in the colour continuum, just yeah. go back to yeah. to the green. Yeah. yeah. Um, should we move on to our next question, ladies? Yeah. Question two: How would you respond to those? Well, we hear this all the time. How do you respond to those people who say that they actually don't have time for self care? Mm. I mean, you hear this often, mm. and and mm. I'm first of all, as a daughter of a school teacher, I'm saying <laughs> I understand teachers have the busiest, and early learning service leaders as well, they have the busiest and fullest plates at the moment. Mm. Um, and, it, and it can feel overwhelming. But knowing how important the self-care aspect of that is, 
Mm. What do you do when someone's saying they can't, haven't got time? Yeah, I, I think, and I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but I think it's really also important to explore concepts of self-care yeah. and to really understand what does that mean when we're talking to people about that. So you might you might be sort of having someone a conversation with someone and they go, I don't have time for self-care. But when you actually explore and discuss what that looks like, they actually might already be doing things that yeah. for them are self-care, but they might not they might not use that same language. Mm -hmm. So they might be, you know, they might go to the gym three times a week, but they don't see that as self-care. Yeah. Um, that for them is just, that's just what they do. Um, I, I have a, um, a family member who uh, is really loves animals and supports the RSPCA and spends a lot of time volunteering there. Like to me, I look at her, she has such a busy life and then she spends a whole weekend sometimes, you know, a couple of times a month at the RSPCA, to me, that would be really stressful. <laughs> For her, that <laughs> really fills her fear. cup. Yeah, so absolutely. I think starting off by not that. making yeah. assumptions, <laughs> by not, you know, putting our own view of self-care onto somebody else, having that mm -hmm. open conversation is really important. But I think um, one of the things that came up in the keynote, and I know you're going to tap on it too as well, is around that um, notice, inquire and provide conversation. So if we're noticing a colleague is having some additional stresses, or perhaps they're responding in a different way to regular stresses. So they might not be normal, they're just the normal things that happen in our world. But for, the, but for their some response, reason that day, yeah, they are, is everything's different. overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, to use some of those skills and that we can learn through BU about notice, inquire and provide, to really touch base with them and see if we can provide some support. And I guess that's where I look at it also. We talk a lot about self-care, but I also like to think about community care. Yeah. So it really is also about considering how we can support our colleagues if yeah. they're having some challenging times. Is there a task we can take off from, you know, off them or is there some other way that we can support and help? And really to model it yourself. Yeah. I think if you're asking others to consider self-care because it's important, then Leave and you're not example. doing it yourself <laughs> um, and you're not taking a break when you need it, you're taking on 20 other tasks when you know you really probably should have said no. Yeah. So I think really developing that workplace culture where it's okay to take time out for yourself. You've got to model it if you want to see it in others. Yeah, mm. yeah. And what happens if you don't? What happens if mm. you, you don't engage in the self-care and you are languishing and then you're at that roadblock and yeah. you do stop, as we've, we've spoken about a couple mm. of times. I like, Deb, what you mentioned about um, not assuming what people understand by self-care. And mm. it's also maybe the question of what self-care isn't. So a lot of people think mm. that self-care is a nice bubbly bath or, yeah. you know, going for a, a walk or it's, to, a, it's a luxury. Yeah. It's something that you do every now and again. But self-care really is something that... That, that fuels you, and as you said about your sister, it, it, it just it, it's really personal. Yeah. So it has to be what fuels you. And self care is not just around mental health and well being. Yeah. Self care is physical. Self care is um, social. It's spiritual. It's professional. So as an educator, what fuels you? If it, if you're interested in student voice and you haven't been able to engage in that space, perhaps develop some opportunities where you can play in that space once again. I think that's important to look at creative ways where self-care can be built into this into the time. I've never mm. thought about that. I mean, those, they, they are, as you say, it's the stuff it's, that fills your cup. Yeah, So if that it's is a, the stuff that you absolutely thrive and you, and, and you hear, you know, young children with great ideas and, mm. and they inspire you, well, that fills your cup Well, instantly. it's like with you on the farm and, and with, yeah. your, with the beekeeping the and the beekeeping honey. Beekeeping and my that's, veggie growing. Yeah, that fuels you and that really builds your cup yep. and, and ensures your mental health and you're a very busy person. I think it's the same with, with educators. So... Um, one example is of a school, what they did is they, they proposed this, this very similar question a few years ago and they all met together with this common issue and they did, did the backward design. So where do we want to be in three years' time and why do we want to be there, more importantly? And they discovered that when they were sick, they had to do lesson plans in the morning. Yeah. Mm. Um, they had to, you know, get them in. They, they were they're stressing about the, the, their classes. Not wanting to take a sick day. No, they were not wanting to yeah. take a sick day. They were... Um, they, um, were marking after school, they were preparing lessons on the weekend and they would just go, go, go and burning the candle at both ends. So what they do is that they all got together and did like a world cafe type situation. Brilliant. And what they devised is they the, the leadership were there and they committed. So they've built in marking time into the timetable. They, they meet in learning communities, this is three years ago, and they developed lesson plans and programs all together so that's accessible to everyone. So it's taking so away that preparation. Think of yep, templates there for everyone to be able yeah, to share. Yeah, and you can tweak it, obviously, yeah. and personalise yeah. it as you need to do in, in the education learning space, but at least you've got that base there to draw upon as a starting base. Yep. And they've built in marking time into the timetable. So rather than take it home... Brilliant. Then, then that's their time. They can then they've privileged that time on the weekend for them, Find so they come balance. back on Monday refueled. Yeah. 
Now, that, that's taken time, yeah. but it's something that that school community recognised was an issue for them three years ago and they've built to this point. And I'm sure at the start when that was first suggested, people would have been going, oh, well, can't how's be done. this going to help? Or yeah. can't be done. But the, the actual fact is sometimes you've actually got to do it so that people can see. I saw mm. in one of the other presentations they were talking about a garden space yes. that had just been created outside of an office. And every time anyone was feeling like it was just getting too much for them in the day, they just take it. A quick bit. Now, like we, we know being surrounded by nature mm. is mm. for the majority of people something that can calm them and make them feel good. And I just thought that was just, yeah. that is something that's achievable at schools and early learning yeah. service centres. So. Well, it's like self-care often, mindfulness may not be for everyone, yeah. but that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder chat might be. So yeah. building, having that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder chat and connecting with another colleague at lunchtime, walking around the Oval, for instance, yep. one, you're connecting, two, you're getting outside, Three, you're having a little bit of a break. Four, you're getting that physical exercise. Yep. So there's some tweaks that can, can be made to build into the, into the mm. day. Um, we've got another question. What's the best thing to do when you actually can see an educator is struggling but they completely shut down and mm. don't want to engage or talk to you? Mm. I reckon we go to the next. I reckon that's, okay, like that's I said, very, it's about question three. Because <laughs> I reckon we're going to answer that next. <laughs> See, and this is where it's so interesting. We said there were themes yeah. that came through, and this is coming through and again it's coming now. Coming through again yeah. now. Yeah. It's just these are really common themes that we're finding yeah. in our services and schools. Yeah, we do. We do get this question quite a bit. So, what, what do you do, or what, what, how, how do you, do you notice? support a colleague yeah, who's experiencing a, a really stressful event? Absolutely, and it's that that notice inquire provide approach. I think is the best one to use. Um, if you haven't heard of the nip, nip it in the bud, or at the nip approach, the NIP model, it's available on the, on the BU um, learning modules. But it's really around that noticing and inquiring sensitively and then providing that support. And that support is obviously contextually in your learning environment and the modules provide some ideas for that. But it's really about providing those structures and like that school community did in the backward planning and design, is where are those structures? What, what happens so that you're not wondering as a solo educator what to do if you know that system support is available? I mean, it is, it is interesting with learning communities we, and, and also um, early learning communities. We often focus on the students and, and the learning people and, the, and there's so much planning that goes into the, the yep. students. However, we don't privilege that for the staff. So yeah. if we're looking at support structures and resources um, for the students, why aren't we doing the same thing for, for educators? And it is great. It's great to see that happening already, but I think it can be done a little bit, bit mm. more. Yeah. But to answer that question, what if somebody yeah. doesn't want to engage and they are shutting oh. you down? What, what's the message that you would actually go back? Because they still need to hear it. I'm not going to judge. Yeah. I'm just going to listen. When mm. you're ready to talk, I want you to know I, I can see that something's upsetting you and I will just be here. Yeah, and it's that, again, it's that shoulder to shoulder, knowing yeah. that you're walking alongside them. And some people don't like to engage. Some yeah. people don't like to share their personal information. Yeah. But as long as they know the avenues for support, either outside of that learning space or within, mm. or they might feel comfortable talking to someone else rather than you. So maybe it's a different approach. So maybe it's a support approach. service that's available yeah. and you just give them the information yeah. and say, I understand. Or another colleague. Yeah, you know, a colleague, yeah, but yeah. it could be somebody outside of that. If they're really worried about, you know, their, their school area, maybe it could be, um, here's a support service. I, mm. I can see you're struggling. If you don't feel comfortable talking to me, there's going to be someone out there who won't judge you, who, who is there, who can provide the right care. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I... The first thought that came to my mind when I read this question of how do I support a colleague who's experienced a stressful event, I automatically wanted to reframe it as how do we support a colleague yeah, yeah, yeah. who has experienced mm -hmm. a stressful event. And I think that's really reflective of what you've both been saying. It's about, you know, it, I might be the one who could support or I could find someone else yeah. who could support yeah. or I could support by linking them with um, someone else within the community. Or it might even be that I've got it in my mind that I'm going to, you know, they might not be ready right now, but yes. I make sure I check in in another week or another two yes. weeks. Um, and I think it's also about you know, coming back to those systems and structures again. So rather than having a colleague who's really experiencing a stressful event and then kind of going, oh, where, where do I have a support number? What, where would I refer them? Having that in advance, building those systems and structures and processes so that when it happens, there's not a delay, yes. that that information is at hand straight away. Yeah. Brilliant. Great, yeah. Brilliant advice. Another question that's come through. How do you prove educator wellbeing is a worthwhile investment? So say there is a school that comes up with this great idea like you, you know, explained from three years ago. Mm. How do you actually go to the powers that be and say, this is something that we should be investing in. It will actually help our school overall. The students mm. will have a much more positive experience. The educators and early service leaders will have a much more positive experience. This is going to benefit us in so many different ways. Mm. 
I'd say get Joe Griggs to come in and have a chat. <laughs> I would love to. I'm going to go the school. <laughs> we are in the early stages of an evaluation and we are actually seeing some pretty amazing things that are coming through. And mm. I can't wait till we can actually, when it's all finished and we can share that because, mm. you know, then, then I'm just hoping every person turns to their peer or their colleague or someone that they know at a school nearby or an early learning service nearby that might not have BU and says, why, why haven't you? Or gets mm. the parents engaged. Why aren't you agitating for this at your school? This would mm. be fantastic. I, I almost you could frame it the other way of going, why wouldn't we? Well, I think it should be framed that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what I meant when I said yeah. why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And there's so many surveys too that the, yeah. the BU surveys are available for staff and for students and for families that you, then you can track and you can yeah. analyse the data over a given time so, mm. so you can yeah, track the results that yeah. way as well. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Mm. I think you'd be tracking, tracking it in those little faces first and foremost yeah. because yeah. that's, that's yeah. where you'll be benefiting. Yeah. Um, another question, ladies. How can I involve parents in transitions, which you were talking about earlier mm. and you both obviously you have mm. plenty of ex ex experience with? Um, and encourage them to be more engaged. Mm. Do you want to start this one, JJ? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, it, it's it's interesting when that the the, the question about parents because it's much more than parents. It's so parents, carers, yeah, grandparents, exactly. aunts, uncles, you know, yeah. siblings. It's it's and, everyone. And, and I think we can also rephrase the question about various stakeholders because yeah. that. The question was particularly about transitions, but if we broaden it out to what stakeholder voices do we have and look at, um, just before the, the panel we were speaking about the concept of student voice and some of the schools that we've worked with actually have either a family member on the action team, on the BU action team or the wellbeing team, or they have a student action team that feed into the action team, the BU action yep. team, which is wonderful to have all those various voices and opportunities. That's the ideal. For the state. That's <laughs> yeah. the ideal. That really is the ideal yeah. to have to have all of that. And the kids are so passionate. Yeah. Like it's gorgeous that and the initiatives that they devise themselves. Because one, one, we all know the change, man, you know, change management um, guidelines is if you're involved and you're invested and you have that commitment, you're more likely yep. to follow through. I think there's a book by at the moment by. Um, Oh, God, I've forgotten his name, by um, James Clear, I think, uh, Atomic Habits, and it's building those habits and, and, and so starting small and then building a habit based on something you're already doing. And I think with the action teams, the action team's already formed. Yep. You've got the student action team that can feed into that. And again, the concepts we spoke about before, starting off small and building bigger, mm. really does make an impact. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I think a lot of the conversations we've had today over the course of this day, day one of the um, virtual conference have been about educator wellbeing. But when we're talking about whole learning communities, obviously we're also talking about yeah. families. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really important when we're considering whole learning community approaches to mental health and wellbeing to include families and members of the broader community in the conversation and the decision making. Yeah. So not just one way informing, yeah. that two way Absolutely. partnership and communication. And I think, you know, transitions, um, there's small transitions happen on every single day within an early learning service. Like, so <laughs> yes, true. The transitions to get a group of yes. toddlers to wash their hands, whoo, that's, a, <laughs> that's great fun. Um, but there's also those really big transitions that happen. But all of them actually play a part in building our mental health and wellbeing. They, yeah. they reflect and respond to how we're feeling on that mm. day. Um, so I think if our aim for this question, our aim was to increase engagement, families' engagement with transitions, then we really need to plan for ways to build and grow that sense of belonging and connection yeah. to our learning community, which is really also a very strong protective factor for mental health and wellbeing. So if families feel connected, they feel a sense of belonging, they're going to want to engage in, and have conversations yeah. around transitions when they happen, whether it be from moving from a toddler room to a kinder room in a, in a long daycare setting or moving from an early learning service to a primary school. So yeah, they'll, they'll want to be engaged. I think that's really important. And I think we often think of transitions as change, but they really also have a basis in continuity. Like I think if we can think about what are existing routines or rituals that we have in our services, that we have in our families, and use these to build on, to support our transitions, then they're much more likely to be engaging and to really be supporting of mental health and wellbeing. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, another question for you both. How do you protect yourself from a negative work environment? Hmm. I know that's kind of broadening beyond mm, yeah. BU, but it's, it's what yeah. you know, people are facing. I think one of the things we talk about, especially around educator wellbeing, is really considering um, what are our personal stresses, mm. like what are the things that impact on us on a day-to-day -day basis, and what are the protective factors we can build 
to support our behaviours around them. So I guess if you are in a workplace that's maybe having some additional challenges and whether that's um, a one-off event um, or whether it's some ongoing cultural issues that are trying to work on but yeah. might take time to change, to really be um, cognizant and considering your own stresses and your own stress behaviour reactions and what protective factors you can put in place to support them yeah. is, is one of the things that comes to mind for me. Mm, good idea, Deb, about checking in not only with yourself but another because, again, it mm. might be an assumption of a particular time yeah. of what's actually occurring. Sorry, my watch is not <laughs> joining the conversation there. <laughs> <laughs> what did that mean? Even the wrong series wants to talk about mental health and wellbeing. Oh, that was funny. Um, but I think it's also important to, to sometimes say no, and educators don't do that really well. Educators just seem to absorb so much. So sometimes it's so about. Sometimes what, they're, they're their own worst enemy. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, sometimes you can't say no. Yeah. It's, it's tricky because if you're on a short term contract, for instance, yeah. in a school environment, if you're in a one teacher school, it is hard to say no, and you, they absorb so much. Educators by their very nature, and you'll know this with your yeah. mum, they're just such caring people mm. and they want to help. Yeah. Like their number one passion is helping and, people. And they love the vocation of teaching. They love it, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So it's again going back to, the, to finding what their core, what refuels them, but it's also about letting balls drop. Yeah. Like, and my line manager says that to, to me as well, that you need to let some balls drop and yeah. say no to something so that you can spend time and invest in the areas that you need to at any given time. Mm. But it is a really tricky one. It's, it's a, I've, mm. I do sympathise with the person that asked that question. It's kind of mental, uh, mental wellbeing um, management though. It's actually yeah. prioritising for mm. you and, and again taking small steps. So what's the one small step that you can take to protect yourself first? Mm -hmm. And then from there, how can you get some, seek some more help? Yeah. Reach uh, out. Just going to throw one at you both. Which <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, she's loving it. Yeah. <laughs> seriously, I mean, you, you, you have the your teams that are out there. They're, they're at the front line. So in an early learning service, um, what is the fact, the one factor do you think that, that is, has the breakthrough for somebody to actually really see the benefits of embracing BU? And I'll ask you the same in relation to schools. Mm. Oh, it's really hard to pinpoint one factor. Yeah. And I, I guess for me, one of the really important things for people to know about um, BU is that it is so flexible and it's about um, what works for you and what your needs currently are. And I think one of the things we really do to support early learning services when they're starting to engage is consider what they're already doing around mental health and wellbeing. So I think... They might be doing They might things. be doing a lot. Which but is always they, nice to hear that you're on yeah, the right path, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so to me, and for often when they kind of start listing it and they might not have actually thought about it before or they might have been doing things which they haven't actually looked at through the lens of mental health and wellbeing, so they haven't recognised, oh, we do this, this and this. Yeah. They haven't recognised that that actually is about building a mentally healthy community. They haven't named it that before. So I think actually having those initial conversations and starting from that strengths-based approach of going, what do we do? Mm -hmm. you know, what are we doing? And really acknowledging and celebrating that as a first step yep. is just so empowering for early learning services. So I think once you've done that, then you can actually go, okay, well, where do we want to go next? And like you said, sort of go, well, in two years' time, I'd like to be here. How can BU support us yeah. to get to there? Talk yeah. to that consultant first, yes. start to put the plans in yeah. place. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's definitely those small steps and that ripple effect, like yeah. starting mm -hmm. small and seeing and feeling and experiencing the joys in the kids' faces or the students' faces when a particular initiative, or equally we're talking today about educator wellbeing, yeah. when the educators feel really valued because you've put a procedure or a structure or a system in place to support them, yeah. How valued do you feel? And, and I think and that's, that's pretty much what everyone wants to feel in their jobs. Yeah, they want validated. to feel they want to, be, they want to be heard and they want to be seen yes. and they want to be appreciated. And they want to feel I mean connected that sense of connection yeah. and belonging's massive. And um, Nicola and Cheryl Lee spoke about it in their session yeah. earlier, is that idea of opportunities for joy. So w yeah. when you have the opportunity for joy but you see the, the joy that comes out of opportunities, it's it, it's just a ripple effect. It's yeah. like yeah, it's mm. um, increases and enhances your will and your enthusiasm to want to do more. Mm. And I think also being able to um, really identify your needs. So if at a learning community, what you really want to do is find some new ways to engage with families. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's something you've identified that maybe after last year with yeah. um, impacts of COVID or just some, uh, you know, 
disengagement perhaps in some spaces of the sector. Well, there was a lot of loneliness, I there think, was. as well, that was coming into that. There was. So you might choose that to be a focus point. Well, that's great. Then you can use the resources and um, learning modules or some of the, even just something as simple as a fact sheet yeah. as your starting point to begin having those conversations to reflect on what's happening with families, how are we supporting with them, how are we asking them what their needs are. Yeah. So really simple steps. But if you're choosing actually to go, Right, well, some of our um, educators have been talking about how they'd really like to build their knowledge and understanding about social emotional learning yeah. and how we can support children. Well, then that's great, start there. Yeah. So, yeah, it's Tick, so there's flexible. There's your first priority, just yep. go. Mm -hmm. Yep. I reckon that's the key with BU is that you can actually adapt it to just what your Absolutely. school needs. Absolutely. Or early learning service. Like it, and it, the broader community, Jo. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really important. Sometimes we do get stuck in a rut and we do forget what else is out there yeah. and connecting there's um check-in sessions that we have online and conversations mm -hmm. that we have online where you hear from other schools and educators and being placed in those conversations where you're hearing and you're listening and you might it might spark an interest of for you that yep. you can then then follow up so i think it's important that to recognize that bu is just more than online website it's it's it is a community mm -hmm. and it is approach and there is just so many different avenues um, where you can delve in and dip into. I'm glad you said that because I literally bang on every single meeting <laughs> we have about the importance of sharing the storytelling. Yes. Because mm. so, yeah, what can seem daunting, you hear somebody else just talking, it might yeah. not be a whole overview, it might be one thing that they've done. Mm. And you go, well, that's something I can actually actively you know, start in my school or early learning service. Yes. And, it, and then all of a sudden it doesn't feel so bad. And then you have the snowball effect of where that but could go. But to share the resource of the idea. So yeah. rather than reinvent the wheel, yeah. If you can have that conversation with someone, and, and that's the, the beauty of the... Well, it's yeah, tangible for the, people the, as well. Yeah. They can actually see that it, that it works. Yes. yes. Um, we yes. were talking before about having, you know, what makes our cups full. Um, <laughs> and we have an educator who said they find it really hard to find the time and energy to help mm. themselves when the cup is depleted through constant giving, constant talking and constantly maintaining positivity in doing so. Mm. So what are your pearls of wisdom there? Yeah, I, and I think that's where when we were talking earlier about, you know, the mental health continuum yeah. um, or the battery, which was shown, I think, in the keynote, um, where if you're on the on the not so full yeah. uh, well, the more emptying end of the battery, that's when you turn to someone who you know is at the full end of the battery yeah. and ask them for some support. And if you are in the full end of the battery, that's when you can be also looking around and going, can I help someone who's at the other end? Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah, one that of the community. things, that community approach is yeah. really important. I, I, re I really believe that when you are full and you're in that green end or that flourishing end is to simply write down, whether you've got it on notes on your phone, whether you've got it on the front of your teacher diary or stuck up on your computer, five things that fill your cup, five yeah. things, mm -hmm. various things that you can do at any given time, whether that's a you know a two week two, two week God two, <laughs> two minute gratitude. It'd be nice to go away for two weeks. A two minute gratitude process or something little, but a variety of things that in a given time when you are stressed and you are at the languishing end and you're not thinking straight, yeah. face it, that you can look back and refer to something or have that buddy system. So a friend can say to you, hey. Stop. Recognize Why don't you recognise and, yeah. and yeah, do that that nip nip it in the bud and the notice and quite provide. Yeah. And provide that support for you or just encourage you to do something that they know fills your cup. Yeah. Well, ladies, this has been awesome today. I mean, the whole day has been fantastic, but there's actually a pretty cool program tomorrow. Or maybe we should talk yeah. resources yeah. first. So everyone, <laughs> yeah. what, what would be your, your point as to if people are listening to this and they're going, okay, well, we're... There's a whole mass of resources there. So mm. what should I be looking out for? Yeah, I think there's a plethora of resources <laughs> on, online. <laughs> but one in particular that we'd like to draw your attention to is our um, wellbeing tools for you, but also the educator wellbeing plan that's recently yeah. been released. Yeah, that's, I think that's not, the that's main only, one. That's relatively really recent. Yeah, yeah, very recent. And the mental health continuum, you've, you've heard us speak about it a lot, but I'd, I'd certainly go and look for that on the BU website. Um, as well, and of course, all the professional learning modules and the numerous fact sheets that we have available online. But if you're not sure, because there is a plethora worth of information on the website, contact the consultant, um, dip into one of the BU sessions, and it's particularly the check-in sessions, and um, that support will be um, provided for you. Beautiful. What can we look forward to tomorrow? Well, another busy day. Well, it is another busy day. <laughs> uh, so we're exploring a, a similar themes, but on a bit of a slightly different approach, I guess. So we're really talking about inclusion tomorrow. So what is meant by inclusion? Why is inclusion a protective factor for mental health? 
what influences and shapes our understanding and practice of inclusion, and also practical strategies and approaches to support everyone's inclusion and connection to the learning community. And I think that's the really big point about practical strategies. We really try and focus so that people can walk away from these sessions and this conference with lots of practical strategies. They can hopefully go and try and just give it a try in your own service or school. Yep. And then if, if you're not sure, buddy system, talk buddy to system. somebody else. Yeah. Uh, well, we've got, we've, I mean, if you're recapping today all the things, we've really just heard that it is incredibly important to prioritise our wellbeing, but we understand that for everyone that's not always easy. Mm. But your idea of just doing the five little tips and, and writing down the pointers of where you can start from is a great way of looking at that. Um, when we're struggling to put ourselves first, we always you know, remember that if we're looking after our own wellbeing, we're obviously going to be in a much better position to actually care for somebody else. I think you reiterated that when you're mm. in the green zone. Yeah. How much easier with the, the full battery, the low battery. I thought yeah. that was fantastic. <laughs> um, how often that we need to look after ourselves is really important to work out what works for you. And it's the same as the BU program overall. You need to find out what works for you individually and also mm. for your whole uh, school or le early learning service community. Um, there's lots of different strategies. There's plenty there. I think. Um, our beautiful Beyond Blue Chair, Julia Gillard, has summed it up perfectly when she says mental health and wellbeing is not something that you need to manage by yourself. And I guess if that was the one message that we could get out of today, on top of the eight million other messages <laughs> that we have, is that, you know, you don't have to do this by yourself. There is so much help available out there and, and BU is your starting point. And, mm. and it might be one question that you ask that starts this to get implemented in your early learning service or your school. But... Ladies, what a top day. I've had an absolute ball. Thank you both for your knowledge, your expertise, your wisdom and your company. Great. Thanks so much Thank for you. joining us today too, Jo. That's all right. Thanks, everyone. Have fun tomorrow. Look after yourselves and we'll see you again soon.